So there are two just exceptional resources that you should be aware of. Uh, this is a very, this first one that's, the image is up there. You need to, you can get this by writing down the title and Googling it and you can download it online. Um, it's fairly, it's fairly long. Um, but if you're thinking about doing um, SNAP or EBT at your farmer's market, um, this is a good place to start. And um, as it indicates, steps, best, best practices, and resources, it's fairly recent. Um, and there are some things in here, there's some information in here that will actually give rise to other questions, but that's a good thing. So it's not like it's a complete um, answer every question you ever had, but there's really a lot of good information in here for those who are interested in, in uh, doing a SNAP program. I'm going to get into what that looks like a SNAP program in just a second. The next slide is um, a resource that's available on ASAP's website or email Jess or I or, or Hollis and we'll direct you to it, but it's also available online to be downloaded and then you can print it out or just read it on, read it on your computer. This is a little bit more in depth. And it's about bridging, well, as it says, a guide to bridging the divide between farmers markets and low income shoppers. We're going to talk a little bit further along about the obstacles that um, exist that make it difficult or challenging for folks with uh, a, in a low income situation to access fresh foods and, and other products at a farmer's market. There's some very recent work, I'm sure there's lots of work that's been done on this, but some very recent thinking about what those obstacles look like and how you could overcome them. So this is a little bit more in depth, um, but it's going to be very helpful with one of the ingredients in a SNAP program, which is the promotion of SNAP, the promotion of that program at your market. To promote a SNAP program at a farmer's market, you need to be aware of what the obstacles are that are going to uh, undermine those efforts or get in the way or make it more difficult to um, to, be, to have a successful program. Um, the steps in planning for SNAP, I've divided them into three sections to help it make the information a little bit more easy to um, convey to you. Assessment, logistics, and promotion. Let's go to assessment first. So a moment ago I was talking about it being successful and the, and the first thing, probably the very first thing you need to, to do is ask yourself why you want to accept SNAP at your farmer's market. What are the goals of you doing that? Um, now, there could be a goal of, of that, that you as a farmer's market or the group, for instance, the Asheville City Market is a program of ASAP. So Appalachian Sustainable Agriculture Project has a fair amount of resources and interests in promoting access to local foods to everyone across the board, not just for SNAP recipients, but anyone. But as a part of that, um, uh, mission of ASAP to provide local access to food is to work on these obstacles for lower income folk having access to local foods at farmers markets. So that could be um, that could be a goal that you embrace as a market. Um, there could be there could be other sort of social goals or community goals that make you feel like this is something you want to be able to offer your community. There are some markets that I've um, worked with recently where they have a very large um, population of folks with SNAP benefits. And so it's in their, it's really part of their main customer base are folks with SNAP benefits. So if they can't use those SNAP benefits at the market, it really undermines being able to build that customer base and, and have that community be involved in the farmer's market. And of course, there's a, there's a possibility that you would like to do SNAP benefits to increase sales. And this one's a, this one I would be cautious about. Um, I. At the Asheville City Market, the percentage of sales that come through SNAP is fairly low. Now, I, I really want to jump in really quick and say it's very important that the folks using those benefits, because statistics are not just about massive numbers, it's about individuals. So when individuals come up and are able to use their SNAP benefits at the Asheville City Market, they are very enthusiastic about that. I think it's a very good thing. But the question I'm not talking about now is how does it impact sales? Now, one thing I will say is overall the market does not gain a lot of sales from SNAP, but individual <coughs> vendors do. There are individual vendors for whatever reason where a lot of those SNAP tokens tend to end up. Um, so again, if you're looking at it purely from a, from a, um, a sales point of view, or are we going to increase the success in terms of sales of our market, well, overall that could be a challenge. 
for specific vendors, it could be very um, helpful. And I will add that recently I did hear of a smaller market, actually just outside this state, where the percentage of their sales that were SNAP was very significant and made a very big difference. The scale was smaller, the market was smaller in terms of its, its size and the, and the total sales than, for instance, a larger market like Asheville City Market. But nevertheless, it was very impressive. I remember getting goosebumps when she said how much they made from SNAP and how significant that one, a part of their budget was. So it is, I think it's a reasonable, if you know why you're doing it, if you know what you're trying to achieve by engaging in having SNAP access at your market, then you'll know what success looks like. Because I think that's important to keep in mind. You need to bring this program on, jump through the hoops, remove the obstacles, make the investment, and then when you're all done and, and the program's rolling, It'd be good if you knew whether it worked out the way you wanted to, what you were hoping to achieve was part of, of your success. <coughs> so that was assessment. That's basically kind of a big picture stepping back and going, what do we, because lately it's become, SNAP has become quite a hot topic in farmers markets and there's a significant amount of state funding that's involved in trying, among other things, trying to facilitate farmers markets that have SNAP. But if you, you need to do the assessment first to make a SNAP won't work at every market for various reasons. Once you've established that this is something you'd like to try, it's something that you'd like to undertake, then here are the logistics, and this is the basics. And I can, one of the reasons this presentation tends to be a little bit shorter is because it really becomes more about questions and answers, so we'll see how that goes. But um, this is a framework, and then you can begin to ask me questions if there's more specific things that you'd like to know. Um, food, and, food and nutritional service, is that FNS? A number, you're going to need one of those. Anybody who handles SNAP, whether it's a grocery store or a farmer's market, gets an FNS number. Um, and, this, and these handouts, this information that I refer, referred to you later has the contact information and all that in it. Um, good stuff. You need a processing terminal, something that looks like this. Um, so the FNS number is free. Again, it's just time, it's not money. A processing terminal, there are various options now. You can purchase one, this costs about $800. You can rent one, which just means you have a lower cost over time, spread out over time. Um, there are also programs, and ASAP, it might be Just, there may be others, I think it may, actually it might be you, Just, can help you with the contact information for how these are being distributed through various funding sources, including the Community um, Transformation Project, or Grant Project, um, to get these at a lower cost or get these free. Um, so that's out there, and ASAP can help you refer you to those contacts. I believe, correct me if it's wrong, it's being handled through local health departments mainly, and so that ends up being the contact. But there have been programs in the past, and there are programs going on right now where you can get one of these free. There is, um, in your folders, there's the last handout, which pictures, which actually describes to you something I'm about to get to, which is the process, but it also uh, has a picture of tokens on it. Uh, wooden tokens, printed front and back. If you're just doing SNAP, it's typically used a one dollar. Although the, it could be a one dollar token. The market I referred to briefly a brief time ago that was having such success did 25 cent tokens. So there was some magic there, that they, because when you do when you, when a SNAP participant uses a benefit, they can't get changed back. So by making it a lower denomination, you increase the flexibility of them being able to spend that at market without having to worry about adding cash in to cover the extra or not getting changed back if they can't cover it with cash. So the, the, the increment of the token is really up to you to decide based on who you, how you think it will work best with your community. We use a dollar, as I said, this other market uses 25 cents. Just as an aside, it's not part of the SNAP program, but if you get set up for SNAP and you get um, a terminal like this, you can also process credit and debit, which typically then is a different token. On that page, it's a $5 token. Um, that folks can use like cash at the market. Again, it's just separate from SNAP, but it's kind of linked into the, t the technology and the other services that you need. You can just overlay it if you decide to. It's more costly than SNAP, and that's another issue to do credit and debit. Um, now, there, there's, I'm going to say some things that there's, uh, other folks have questioned and I'm wondering if this is true, and, and Hollis, you might be one of them, and feel free to, but uh, merchant services provider. Um, a merchant services provider who's, is, is the entity on the other end of this. Um, this, as I understand it, does not, 
when this gets when the card gets processed here, whether it's SNAP credit or debit, does not land in your bank account. It has to go through someone before it lands in your bank account, and that's a merchant services provider. Um, the fees for these the fees for the, because this is where the fees for the credit and debit cards come in, um, and there are fees associated. It's not clear exactly what the fees are associated with with SNAP tokens. At Asheville City Market, I can tell you that there's a flat fee every time we run a SNAP token a, a transaction. There's a flat fee that the merchant services provider charges to us for that transaction. There been some, there's been some confusion, and I'm, in, I'm amongst it, that, that, that there are entities where the, there are situations where the SNAP transaction is without a fee. Am I getting this right, Hollis? No this no came fee. up. No fee. I don't know how they did that. I should have found out before we were talking right now. It sounds like a state program that was happening towards the end of last year where the state of North Carolina had contracted with a merchant service provider um, to facilitate SNAP access at farmers markets. And you could have been part of a deal at that time that was being offered that reduced or eliminated some of these fees. So all I can tell you is, or maybe not, or maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just, maybe there's more options out here than I'm aware of. But I can tell you that there are certainly some situations where there is a fee, and if there's not a fee, I'm thinking there's something else going on there that it's not clear to me. But if you go through the community transformation um, grant projects, they address some of these other things. Like there's a there's one not on here, which is a wireless fee, which is the cost of this being able to communicate to the rest of the world. That that fee is waived as a part of the this funding. If you get that, you get a free terminal in your wireless for a year, I think, or for some period of time, and then it's depending on the availability of funding whether it's renewed. Um, but in any case, whether, whatever the fee is, and again, it's lower, whatever it is, if it, if it exists, it's less than um, credit or debit. It's, it's not a big fee. It's not a significant fee for it to process SNAP. And of course, there's no fee to the, um, the benefit, the person with the benefit who's using it. There's no fee to them. It would only, if there is a fee, it's captured by the market through the merchant services provider. You need a bank account where the funds land. So when, so when uh, I swipe my SNAP card, and I get handed the tokens to go spend them on food at the market, that money is now transferred from the program, the SNAP program, into your bank account. Process and procedures. So um, you'll need a, a way of handling these SNAP transactions. The typical way, and the form that I provided you with, outlines the, the system that's used at the Asheville City Market. Um, basically, the tokens go out and are, Swipe the card, hand the uh, SNAP recipient their tokens. The tokens go out into the market. Just as an aside, there's limitations on what those what SNAP benefits can be spent on, but those are available to you through FNS um, guidance on what products you can and cannot buy. In general, it's food that you are going to consume, uh, fruit uh, or plants that are going to produce food, but there's some prepared foods and hot foods that you're not allowed to use. But that's all, that's all details and you can get that clear. Customer goes out into the market, spends their tokens. Now the tokens are out there amongst the, mar amongst the vendors at the market. You need a procedure to get those tokens gathered back in and a way to record what each vendor has given you. So at our market, we, they get sold and then during the market, someone goes out with a log and gathers up all those tokens, records how many they took from each vendor, uh, the vendor signs, yes, that's how many I gave you. Now the tokens have come back to the market with a record of who it was who redeemed them. The last step is you owe those vendors that money. So now you have to have a mechanism to pay the vendors um, for the tokens that they have redeemed. And that money will come out of your bank account. So, so there is a little bit of delay, too, of paying the vendors. So it takes a couple days for it to land in your account. It'll probably take you more than a couple days to actually pay it back out. Some markets pay it back out the same day, so that you would have to have a little buffer built in. I think West Asheville, um, last I spoke to them, anybody who knows differently can correct me, but I think that she was like, their manager was actually um, writing checks the day that she um, received those tokens. And it's basically just a question of how much bureaucracy, how much administration, and how much paperwork you're going to generate to get from one, one point to the next, to the end of the process. 
Um, at the Asheville City Market, we pay out our vendors every other week. So we collect tokens one week, collect tokens next week, the following week they get paid for the two previous weeks. I've, I've heard of markets that do it monthly. You know, it really, it really is very much up to the market and the, and the, and the vendor's tolerance for how long they feel like they want to wait. Um, as I said, there are some vendors that accumulate a lot of these and it adds up to be a significant amount of money even over a couple weeks. There are other vendors that don't, you know, they say, I'll just wait till next week, I don't have that many. Um, so this, these are the basics of um, logistics. I tried to talk about costs here. Could be free. The worst it would be is $800, because that's buying one. Um, tokens, you can go fancy, high color, you know, double-sided, um, a few hundred dollars. Again, it really depends on how many tokens you're going to order. There, there's nothing, there's nothing in, there's really nothing on this list of basics that you can't handle, that any market couldn't handle. If you go back to the goals, it's really what, you know, how much resources you want to put to it. But there's nothing over here overwhelmingly expensive or overwhelmingly time consuming. The most time consuming thing is that process of going out and gathering the tokens back in and then having, having them counted, recounted, and then the check written. But really, now, there are some markets who would disagree with me who feel like this has been a little bit burdensome. It does take some time, but my message to you is, if you want to do SNAP, um, you can do it. It's manageable, and there's help out there to help you do it, to help your market take it on. Right now, there's, there's significant more help than there's been in recent years to help markets bring SNAP access into their, um, into their farmer's market. This isn't really about credit or debit, but it is, a, it is sort of a coattail thing for SNAP, or the other way around sometimes. Um, it is more costly to process credit and debit in addition to this. In fact, I would suggest to you that if you're doing any significant level of credit and debit token sales, you're going to need some way to fund that. At the Asheville City Market, we charge our vendors $3 a week. It ends up being about $5,000 for the year to cover, the, to cover any associated costs with this. Now, we're talking about um, thousands of dollars worth of tokens being sold every week. We're talking about a high volume system that's costing $5,000. I don't want you to think that that's what it would cost. It certainly wouldn't cost that to do SNAP by itself. But you could manage doing SNAP credit and debit at a much lower cost than $5,000. We're, we just are very labor intensive in, in the way we handle it, and it, it takes us a little bit more investment of resources to get it done. It's all doable, it's all manageable, and there's loads of help out, out there right now. It's, it's just, it's really similar to the, what was talked about in terms of marketing and word of mouth. One of the, one of the keys for Asheville City Markets promotion, it was word of mouth. Um, when folks found out who had this benefit, um, the word spread to folks, other folks they knew in their communities, their neighbors or friends. The word got out even before we started to try to do some promotions. But there are, um, there is outreach that you need to do, and partnerships that you need to find and develop. There's, like I said, right now there's a number of folks out there, health departments, other agencies, those who associate with distribu dis distributing the SNAP benefits who you can partner with to get the word out that your market now accepts SNAP. You will now accept that from uh, folks with that benefit. But promotion is, is kind of, like you can get it all set up, but you can't just like turn the machine on and go, okay, now we're ready. The next step is to let fo obviously let folks know that they can come and use it. And there are folks out there who, who want to help you do that. So you're not, <coughs> unlike maybe marketing where it's sometimes you're, you're on your own, there are partners out there you can find. Jess can help you, in the, and the health departments can help you identify them. The health department itself is one um, to promote, to do outreach and to promote the program. Um, and as you do this outreach and develop these partnerships and attempt to do prom promotion, th this is a key um, concern. This is something that takes some time to stare at. And people are staring at it and thinking about it a lot right now and trying to figure it out. Because there are obstacles built in to, there are obstacles that exist that will make it difficult for the, the SNAP recipients to access your market um, and use their benefits there. Just a couple of them are. There's price, there are price concerns. Um, obviously, if you're receiving a benefit due to, due, due to lower income, you're very price conscious. conscious. So, and, and this could even be not true. 
And it often isn't true that the, that the prices that they find at the market, you saw in some of the, you know, there's some, there are some deals at the market, there are some lower pricing at the market than you will find probably anywhere in your community. The opposite is true too, you will find higher prices there. But there are opportunities for folks to um, shop on a budget and save some money and still go to a farmer's market. There are, but it, is a, it can be a limitation, and even if it's not, it's a perceived limitation. People will believe that they have to spend more if they go to a farmer's market, whether it's true or not, that's what the, that's what the assumption is that's found widespread through research and questionnaires that that's what people think. Um, another, another obstacle, and this is, there's, when I was at a, a workshop or, or a meeting about this, and there were like six or seven of them. I'm just trying to capture some main ones. Um, One-stop shop. Again, um, if you have limited transportation options, childcare options, you know, uh, I, I may have the freedom, you know, where I can go to a market when I feel like it and go back the next, you know, next week and pick something up. But there's a pressure, as you might imagine, to do one-stop shopping. You know, one-stop shopping at a place where you, where the prices are affordable. Um, farmers markets do not tend to be one-stop shops. You know, you can't. There are a lot of things you can't get at a farmers market that you will pick up and that you need that you go to a grocery store for, um, or a discount store, or whatever. So that's a challenge because now the person can go get their produce, they can get their cheese, they can get whatever food products are available at the farmers market. But if they need laundry detergent or toilet paper or whatever else they need. That, that you can't get at a farmer's market, or, or a banana for that, for matter, even food products that you can't get at a farmer's market. It breaks, it breaks this ability to have a one stop <coughs> shop, and that's, that's an additional obstacle. I'm gonna, by the way, I'm offering these obstacles, and I'm not gonna offer you very many solutions right now, because I think it's a little tricky, it's a little difficult, but you need to be aware of them, because when you work with your partners, when you, when you find partners to work with, you need to bring these with you, and say, well, how can you help us think about how to overcome these, because these are hard. Um, comfort is a, comfort's another one. It doesn't just apply, some of this doesn't even just apply just to low, folks with low income or SNAP recipients. Comfort level is referring to, this is not something I'm used to. You know, a farmer's market, I haven't shopped at a farmer's market before. There could be various ingredients. It could just be that, that it's unfamiliar. You know, I'm used to going in independently, going through the produce section, going to the grocery store, putting stuff in my cart. Um, I'm not, you know, you're standing right across from me now and I'm, you know, I don't know how this works. I mean, people think that there's a way that it works. You know, that, I mean, you know, and once you're there and you've experienced it, you realize it isn't that different really than shopping at a grocery store. It just happens to be the counter person's right there rather than over the cashier and you can talk more to them. But there's a perceived, again, it's a perception that uh, am I going to fit in? Am I going to do something? You know, do I have to ask for the price? You know, what? You know, how does this work? I, I don't feel comfortable. There could be other factors. It could be language barriers. Um, any any ingredient in a, in a, that takes somebody out of their comfort zone and isn't the way they normally do it is an obstacle to getting them to come to a farmer's market and shop. Um, and there's a few other lists. These are the ones that impress me the most, so I include them here. But there, there are several others that, or a few others, that um, are captured elsewhere that you can refer to. But you're, if your promotion is going to be a, effective, you need to do outreach, you need to do it with partnerships, and you need to keep these things in mind as you're doing it, ways that you can maneuver to try to overcome this. You know, like, like the, SNAP, the promotional program I mentioned earlier, where at, at our market and at other markets, and this is actually widespread, where SNAP recipients can come and either regularly or in some way that's capped or over a certain period of time can use their SNAP benefits and then have it doubled or added to. Um, there's, there's funding out there for that. There are markets that do it in-house with their own revenues that they can match these. Uh, so that, the, again, that, that's one that would, that's kind of an easier one if you can get the resources, the funding to do it, to try to address the price issue because now, um, they're getting, instead of $10 worth of SNAP tokens, they're getting $20 worth of purchasing power. Um, you know, the one-stop shop, you can, we've tried to identify bus routes that go by our market, but that's a really inconsistent, you know, solution and doesn't always work out. Um, you really, this is a creative things. You know, comfort, when you do your outreach, you know, I personally think that the, a representative of the market that goes out and do an out, like if we're gonna do an outreach into a community that's not familiar with farmer's markets, I should go. 
the market manager should go, someone in the market should go. So then that, so now you, and you say, you, when you're doing this outreach, I'm trying to just throw out a few ideas. Do this outreach, you say to the people, come to the market, if you have a problem, you come see me. I'll help you with any questions that you have. I have a bright yellow vest on, come talk to me. If you have any questions about the tokens or how they work, or the pricing, or you know, how you weigh things, or anything else about the market, come see me. Again, putting a face on it. Um, but these are, these are tough and they're time consuming to overcome these obstacles. But there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm out there to do it. There are other ways that people do it besides the tokens. I've seen it done with handwritten script. You know, they, they don't buy the tokens, they use a piece of paper. So there, it, there isn't, the, the food stamps, the folks who um, provide the food stamp benefit and extend it to farmers markets, meaning the government who runs the program, has requirements about how it's used. But it doesn't, but there's flexibility about how it's processed. So you don't necessarily have to buy tokens. Um, there are other ways that you can do it. With a technology that is at hand, a smartphone, in the not too distant future, you'll be able to process a SNAP transaction on your own phone. Then it would make more sense, assuming that most vendors would have a, a smartphone that could do that, to decentralize it, because then you'd eliminate all the logistics of tokens and check writing and all that other thing. Now, how I'm saying that in ignorance. I know that the problem is that there's a, there's a contractual relationship that prohibits that now. It's not technology, because I know they're doing it in other states. Now, I shouldn't say, I should not have said in the not too distant future, because I don't know what's going to happen. But it's, it's physically, technologically possible if North Carolina gets on board and, f and allows that kind of arrangement. It varies by community and by customer base what the obstacles are. The first obstacle is if the market doesn't accept the tokens. That's the first obstacle. So the priority right now and why it has become such a push to have markets take them is because if you don't accept them, all the other obstacles don't matter. You need to be able to, just a second, you need to be able to accept the, the market tokens first and then you can go to these other obstacles. The question is, because the folks who are trying to solve this problem, who are trying to increase access to local foods to everyone in the world, including lower income people, they're, they're looking out there and going, well, if they can't even accept their tokens, then they can't, we, we're, we're dead before we can start. We don't even get anywhere. So then they go, let's, let's have them accept the, the tokens. So there's been a broad, you know, brushed attempt to encourage markets, as you said, to accept these SNAP tokens. Then the next issue becomes, is it right for every market? And the answer is no, it's not right for every market but for different reasons. It could be wrong for a market because they can't afford it. It could be right for a market because they want to do it. It doesn't matter whether it makes them any money. They want to do it. That could make it, that going back to the goals, they're, then they're going to do it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what their customer base is. It doesn't matter how much money they're going to make. They're made a, okay, I'll use ASAP as an example. Asheville City Market is going to, have open, it's going to offer SNAP tokens onward. It just is, because part of the mission is to increase access to everyone, including low income, to fresh foods and farm, farm foods. So that's going to happen. But every situation, your market, you need to figure out why you want to do it before you decide if you can do it, or how well you can do it, is why you want to do it. You know, do you have to, just understand this, these are the basics. You don't have to use tokens, you can use coupons. Yeah, you know, you have to be conscious about counterfeiting or other issues that come up, but there's nothing on this list that stops you from doing it. Nothing. No cost, not right now, there's no cost, no time consumption that stops any market from having SNAP if they decide that it's a goal that's appropriate for their market. Any process that you do in-house to track and then reimburse Okay, that doesn't somehow mess with the FNS policies of, of trading any money or having, I'm not exactly clear what you're saying, but I think, I think the answer is you can do that. The only cautionary thing would be, you know, the, the, the federal government and the state that administers the program is fairly sensitive that, you know, that for instance, um, I can't take one of these tokens and go over and say, could you give me 50 cents for this? You know, there's, there's fraud, there's ways of, there could be ways that would cause there to be concerned about who actually is receiving the benefit and where did it end up going and is there a paper trail about what happened? But, I, but again, like I said, 
on a small scale like that, you know, West Asheville tailgate market, which is a bigger scale than what you're describing, does it on a shoestring compared to what we spend. So all I'm saying is the scale can be adjusted down, and I think you can make it work. As, right, as long as... This one and then I bring it all up. As long as benefits are not transferring from folks that it shouldn't in some way, and you feel that you can deal with errors, mistakes, fraud, anything else that could come up in the system. You feel like you've got it boxed in because everybody's locked into this room and nobody's getting out until you know what's going on, then a scaled down version can work. Because the alternative for you is not doing it. But again, yes, it would be embarrassing. Yes, it is a headache. But again, the success of it and the appreciation for the success of it, if it can work, is, is, is tempting versus the alternative which is nothing. So I, I, you're getting cautionary words given to you that I think are wise and that you would want to weigh into it. Like you don't want to embarrass people, you don't want to have them put stuff back because they didn't have enough on their card. But, it, but again, if you have a relationship with these, these folks, as you do with any customer. Check balances? You can check balances, yes. Okay, so if well, I'm you gotta, without a machine though, you got to call. You're not using the machine, right? I have got nothing yet. You got no, no, but I mean if, if we do it, we'll do the machine. You just, yeah, you just take it one step at a time, go through the logistics, and create a system. I never believed that it could run the way it's run. I've seen it run. I never would have done I would never do it that way. I don't know how it works. You know, it just is not the way I would do it. But that's because I work at this market that's got the resources to do it this way, and I'm locked into that. So I'm trying to free us up to, to know that there are other ways that you can do it. There, if you decide this final word. If you decide this is what you want your market to do for whatever reason, whether it's increased sales or a community service or community outreach and embracing everyone and bringing them into local food, if you decide you want to do it, you can do it. You, I believe you can do it in this atmosphere right now with the resources that are out there to support access to local foods through the SNAP program. It can happen at any scale at any market if that's what you want to do. Made possible with funding from the North Carolina Community Transformation Grant Project and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention.